I talked to a man who uh, is German, but he taught French and English at the university. And I said to him, well, which language do your students find easier? And he said, well, in the beginning, of course, English, because it it's, uh, uh, doesn't have all those careful cases and so on. <coughs> but he said later, French, because French is logical. Whereas English, it's intuitive. You can't say it has to be this or that. It depends on all sorts of nuances of feeling. You, if you who only speak English probably don't even realize the extent to which it's an intuitive language. Mm -hmm. But uh, the French can't get out of that mold. And they can't, if they were to translate my books, I only have one book in, it, in France. I don't remember which one it is. It may be on meditation. I, I mean, no, I didn't write one. Whatever it was, Padma <laughs> told me. By the way, I just heard today from Padma that uh, Do It Now has sold in two years 26,000 copies in Japan. Wow. That's great, isn't it? And I think it's Education for Life in Taiwan has sold 9,000. Just one little book, so this is great. Anyway, um, the for the language you're brought up in forces your way of thinking. The culture you're brought up in, the English are far more precise in their use of words than the Americans. English English is very good. I enjoy it more. I have to say that when I write, I I'm definitely influenced by P.G. Woodhouse because <laughs> he was the best writer I think in this century. In English, he was so precise in the words he used, and although he was strictly a farceur, strictly a comic, but he wrote fantastically well, and it's made me more conscious of the choice of words that I use and the rhythm and so on. He sometimes gets sloppy, but uh, after all, he's only writing comedy. But he was really very, very good. Um, so the language is a large part of it. And the reason I enjoy the Italian is that the Italian has more heart to it. It's more logical in a way, but it's more feelingful. You'll notice that languages have vibrations that way. In speaking languages, if you can tune into the vibration, you can get the language. Italian's the last language I've learned of my nine or so languages. But uh, I speak it well, but I only began to speak it well when I tuned into their consciousness. You, for instance, well, I said quando. If it were German, quando. <laughs> you see, they'd say the same letters, but it would be much more qua, no, da. Ich will es nicht tun. And the Italians would say, non voglio fare. <laughs> And so this emphasis on consonants you find in, in the Germanic languages is very strong. American also more strong. In Czechoslovakia, where they're very, their mentality is very precise, they have a town called Prumsk. <laughs> <laughs> Not a single vowel. Prumsk. <laughs> and the Italian, it's much more vowels, less emphasis on, on the consonants. Um, so, anyway, what? What about the Spanish? Spanish, it's much more vowels, but it tends to be less precise in its thinking. Who said that? Me. Yeah, you. It's yeah. less precise in its thinking. Colombia. Huh? I'm from Colombia. From Colombia. Mm -hmm. Well, as I was saying, hablado is a bit sloppy, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no puedo hacer. It's a sort of a they don't emphasize the consonants as clearly, and it shows a certain tendency. The Mexicans have the saying, manana. So sort of, well, we'll figure it out eventually. <laughs> but there is less of that precision than you have in the Italian, where it's much more crisp. And it shows a way of thinking, too. So if, if you're in a country, you need to tune into the people there. When I first went to Mexico in 1945, I didn't know... Spanish. I'd studied a little bit. And uh, I remember I wanted to go into a restaurant to ask for a glass of water. And I 
practiced before going in there to say it with the right accent. And uh, there was some American standing at the counter there. And when I said this, she said, oh, are you, are you Mexican? I felt I, I had done well. <laughs> but in Spain, they've asked me if I was Mexican. And in <laughs> In Swiss, German Switzerland, they've asked me if I was from Germany. And in Paris, they've asked me if I was from Geneva. And so with different languages, I try to get the accent right just because it's fun for me. But I don't urge anybody to do it. It's just my game. I, I know I was with several of our people in Florence recently, and, and sh the shopkeeper, we were in a shop there, the shopkeeper said, well, where are you all from? I know you're Italian, but where are these people from? <laughs> so it, this is my little personal game. doesn't mean anything. It's just fun. Well, have you any questions? What did they ask you where you're from in London, then? What's that again? <laughs> where do they ask you where you're from in London? <laughs> Listen, I'll tell you something. When I went to school in England, I was there two years. And I, well, first of all, I, I said gasoline. And they all read me up and down because they say petrol. They don't say gasoline. And <coughs> so they began calling me gasoline. <laughs> and I really worked hard at developing the English accent. My father was appalled when I went back to Bucharest and heard me saying no. <laughs> well, I, I felt I had the accent down pretty good, you know. And I was in the sick rooms at the school there in Malvern Hills, and the maid uh, in the sick room said to me, I saw you, Cockney. <laughs> But I have never had an Englishman think I was English. <laughs> They've always felt there's something not quite right. Most of them somehow guess I must be American. <laughs> but I must say, when I go to England, I find myself quickly slipping into more of that accent. Now I refuse to give in. <laughs> Probably just hoisting the white flag, I don't know. <laughs> But I'll tell you a story. There was this American um, who met an Englishman in a, in a pub in London. And <clears throat> the, the uh, Englishman told him his name was Addison. And the American said, What? You, you, you must mean Harrison, don't you? The Englishman said, What? A high to high to? Ha's a high, a hess? A hell with a hen, if that is well, Addison. <laughs> so, uh, Cockney Cook will put the am in the oven. <laughs> Any other comments, questions? Hmm. Shall we have something more serious? <laughs> so, would you want to talk about the lay order at all? Is that too big a topic for this hour? I've talked about it today. I've talked about it in this sense, and I did it deliberately. That we have to understand that there are gradations of um, perception. And whereas certain ideals are held out, um, they can't be driven down anybody's throat. We have to say that, okay, I see that as the ideal. It's good to understand that it's the ideal. It's a mistake to say, well, my way is just the same. It isn't. There, if you really are absolutely dedicated to God, as a master is dedicated to God, um, it's a very different thing. And you got to accept that it's not just... The word relative is misused. It's relative to something. It's not just haphazard and chaotic. So... Proper dedication would be that of that man I told you about who uh, had given everything to God and God tested him. And uh, because just at that moment his wife had died, his newborn babe, 
No one to protect it. And that's when God said, come. That's the divine law is that you have to give everything to God. Now, you can't expect everybody to do that. It would be an invitation to hypocrisy to demand that of people. People have to accept where they are. The fact that you are on a level where you know that you want God. You want to be supportive to this whole concept. And it's right and good that there be stages to that. It's foolish to affirm I'm that now because it's the in thing to be. Be what you are sincerely. And you should, however, reach that point where... Um, Master told me a story, an odd story. I don't think I've ever told this story before. But he met a sadhu who he was a grown man, but he said he had a baby-sized male organ, is the way he put it. In other words, it was just the, he had not developed sexually. He, the Master said, I was so touched to see this. He was a Naga sadhu and wore no clothing. But he said he was so pure that he never even developed his sexual organ. And he said that this man said to me when uh, he asked me, he asked me a few questions. He said, well, supposing you've prepared your dinner and you're just about to sit down and somebody comes to the door and uh, what would you do? He said, well, I'd give him my meal. Right. Supposing you sit down after preparing another meal and somebody else comes, I'd give him my meal. Supposing somebody, you've done it again and somebody else comes, Master said, well, I'd give him half and I'd keep half. Worldliness! <laughs> he, was, <laughs> he said, you're no sadhu. Of course, Master was a sadhu, but uh, Master told me this story to show the uh, extreme of renunciation that people have when they absolutely feel that everything is belongs to God. Now, that's not somebody something that people in this country can... Even, and even expect to be. But they should understand this is the ideal because only if they have that ideal can they have something to work toward. That uh, not owning anything, that's not even feasible in this day and age. But uh, it's an <coughs> ideal. And whereas it's perfectly right, nothing to be said against it. Have your own bank account, have your own car, do what you can for God, don't suppose, however, that that's the end of the line. That the end of the line is that you really don't have anything. And Master did have a bank account, but everything he had belonged to God consciously. He didn't ever have the feeling that it's his. Well, that's what you need to develop in this society. You may need a bank account. Somebody's got to pay your bills, you know. You may need a car. I remember, however, when my parents... Um, offered to give me a car, and I had just been put out of SRF, but I didn't want to have anything so expensive in my name. It just, I didn't want it, and I, I deferred accepting this gift for several months until I realized that I couldn't function in this country without a car. I finally did accept the gift of that car. You'd never perhaps believe even or begin to understand how I suffered in having to accept that car as in my name. I just felt dirty, but I felt I've got to do it because who else will take care of it, you know? And so that's an attitude toward which one must grow. Well, the lay order is a step in that direction, but think of it as a direction. Think of how can I dedicate myself more and more perfectly to this ideal of uh, just belonging to God. And you'll find that he doesn't expect you to dive off the deep end, but bit by bit as you do it, you see that he is taking care of you until finally you reach the point where you know that he does and you don't need to worry. He will take care of you and he'll test you too. Sometimes he'll test you right up to the limit. I know when I was sitting in that courtroom in the Bertolucci case, I heard these people telling lie after lie. I knew it wasn't true, but I didn't feel to say, to say anything. I said, if Divine Mother, if you want to do this, it's you who are giving me this. 
I accept your curses, I accept your blessings, it's all the same to me. It still comes from you. And so there was no sense of inner outrage, or why are you doing this to me, or uh, this isn't fair, nothing. What you want to give me, I accept. And so with that attitude, I sat calmly through the whole thing. I admit it was, it was uh, afterwards I felt hurt. I said, Divine Mother, why did you put me through that? You didn't have to do it, but I still accepted it. I never blamed Divine Mother. I never said she should have done it differently. I just wanted to know why she had done it. But uh, I never doubted that she knew what she was doing. I've seen it was a wonderful thing. Great blessings came from it on all levels. So uh, again and again I have seen tests that, for instance, when I was thrown out of SRF, <clears throat> the accusations that Tara and Daya and others made against me, I knew they weren't true. They were just unbelievable. How they could have even imagined those as being my real motive. For instance, getting that land in New Delhi, which was really a miracle, 2,000 societies had tried to get it. All had been turned down. Only we were, I was accepted. And I thought, this is a great triumph for Master. And suddenly... Letter came back from America accusing me of wanting to set up myself as a new guru and all sorts of things that had never entered my mind. And uh, I was left without anything, really nothing. Tara said, well, just take any job that comes along. But I thought, no, my life is given to Master. She said, well, see that you get the things that are yours at Mount Washington, your clothes and so on. I said, but I've given everything to Master. I don't own anything. Oh, how dramatic. <laughs> it, well, I'll tell you what you do. If there's anything you don't want, you can just dump it in the trash can in the hallway of this hotel. I mean, it was not a very feelingful response. I was feeling so deeply wounded, and she thought that I had just been manipulating everything with Machiavellian glee and that she'd done me in and caught me out and I just could not understand it and I admit I suffered deeply I lay on my parents bed in Atherton and uh, I just stared at the ceiling I couldn't think what to do with my life I didn't want to go back to a worldly life my parents were offering me a car I didn't want the car it was just a very bad time and yet I got a letter of message from Ananda Moima, accept this as your guru's grace. This was one thing I could not accept as his grace. But it was, and I discovered that it was in time. The one thing I could not accept and refused to accept from them was that I could not serve my guru. The only way I could not serve my guru was by doing nothing, which is what they demanded of me. They... Um, Tara gave me only one positive suggestion. She said, you had a good reception in Fiji. Why don't you go to Fiji? <laughs> <laughs> they wanted to get me out of their hair, that's all. But uh, it didn't work out that way. Their bad luck was that my parents had settled in Atherton. <laughs> anyway, that's a long story. I have seen that it was, it was a grace of my guru. You all wouldn't be here. Ananda wouldn't be here. The things Master told me to do wouldn't have been done. They'd never have published a book of mine. Nothing. So, yeah. You were going to ask a question? <laughs> I was. It's okay to ask a question. You know, I've read the path a number of times, and there was a story in there that, that you told um, and wrote about Master that I've always wanted to ask you about. Is, Back, sort of back to the Gita time time frame again, but when he told you to um, to uh, work like lightning, and you know he was having you edit quote edit the work like lightning, don't change a word. Listen. What does that mean? I, I, I okay. There's absolutely no way of describing or explaining what that meant. It meant nothing. <laughs> Do you know that was Master's way of disciplining sometimes. He would put you in an absolutely impossible situation, something you couldn't begin to understand rationally. You had to understand it on another level. He would sometimes... <coughs> there was one woman who 
was always sort of had an answer to everything he said. And so he deliberately said something to her that was totally illogical. <laughs> there was no way she could answer that. And so she stopped. And while her mind was frozen still for a moment, he was able to say what he really wanted. <clears throat> His way of teaching was not necessarily rational. It was intuitive. Sometimes he would say things in order to accomplish a deep, another longer purpose end. For example, <clears throat> what he really meant, I think, there was don't change the spirit. But he couldn't say that then. How would I know what the spirit was? I was too young. Don't change a word. He knew that I wouldn't. I mean, Divine Mother is not stupid. Let's face it, whatever else she is, she's not stupid. He told me before they went out, he went out to the desert to work on his writings. He said, I asked Divine Mother whom I should uh, have come out with me. And he said, your face appeared. And I asked her twice more to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> Each time your, your face appeared, that's why you're going out there. But mind you, I was 23 years old. Yes, I had wanted to be a writer. Yes, I'd studied writing. I knew something about editing. But the teachings I had yet to learn a lot about. And uh, Divine Mother, he gave me the Omar Khayyam. He gave me the Gita. There was no way I could have really edited it then. He had Tara doing that. I couldn't be anything but a... a sort of a obstacle underfoot. But he was pointing me in a direction which many years later I was able to exploit. So that when I wrote, uh, did interpret the Omar Khayyam, I, I know I did a better job than what they've done. In fact, it's a good job, I have to say it. And the Gita, I know I could do a good job if I'd just get my hands on the original. But without that, I don't. I just don't see how I could. But he was talking long term. He was trying to get things established, knowing that he would be leaving his body in two years. He was trying to set directions, which would be explored later on. And uh, I could have remained in the work and edited, but that wasn't my main work. The main work that I had to do, I could not have done in the work. So you never knew... Um, logically what he was saying because often there was a much deeper meaning otherwise yeah I just uh, there's no way you can explain that except what I said don't change the meaning which is what he really was getting at well okay everybody let's have a few moments of silence <laughs> <laughs>